Hi, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's a total pleasure to be here with you. So for those of us, and it's probably true of everybody in the room who, like me, are data geeks and care about health, this is a fantastic time to be alive. So I'm going to show you why I think we're at this transformative time when it comes to national data and hopefully spark uh, some new ideas and some new collaborations. So. You heard from Nancy about, I loved her analogy, that vast territory that exists beyond New York and beyond the genome. And you can see from my graphic, I'm going to spend the entire 12 minutes I have in that graphic that's beyond, because my smallest unit here is the individual going out to nest it in a community, in a country, and in the global community recognizing that biologic factors, social factors, influence every single level. So I especially hope those of you who are here who say, I don't care about anything beyond that inner circle, will give me 10 minutes to try to convince you that it's worth caring about that. Okay, here's the first reason. This just shows the range of mortality outcomes across countries. So life expectancy, mortality rates for, for infants under five, maternal mortality, huge ranges. I don't think any of us think this is at the genetic level, this level of range. This is all about the, this extent of range is dramatically shaped by the social environment, by the physical environment, by the policy environment, one that we can do an enormous amount about, but, and here's the big but, we haven't really known how to act on it, and that's the big data question. So the World Health Organization had a commission on so-called social determinants of health. Think about it as all of those social environmental features. What was the conclusion? The conclusion was dramatic impact on health, but, and here was the remarkable part, they put together the best minds around the world, and it was, we don't know a lot about what works to change it. That's an opportunity for everybody here because the data is now available and increasingly we can collectively make the data available to start to understand quantitatively what it takes to change it. So one last note on why anyone here might care who has been focused at the programmatic level, um, and that's this simple bucket analogy. I have a PhD in public policy, but I was trained as a physician. Uh, my clinical area is pediatrics. I deeply value what goes on inside the hospital, inside the clinic. But even for those of us who do, uh, getting that right without getting the environment right is truly pouring water into a bucket with huge holes, what would be examples. Uh, you can take any of them. You can take what's happening uh, with our infant mortality rate in the United States. If it was all about hospitals, we would be doing much better. You can look at how we compare to Canada on life expectancy. Uh, again, unless we get that social piece right. So why do we care? Three reasons. It can help us with the program on the ground. We can change that ecosystem, but also it's fundamental to taking any solution to scale. Okay, so why is it an exciting time and what's big data look like? So anybody ha who hasn't, uh, who doesn't know our work at World Before, know when this picture, this is a UN picture, big data at the UN. Uh, anybody want to shout out a year that they think this big data version 1.0 is from? Okay, good. So this person is very close, 2016. I am sure I will be back in Geneva in a couple weeks and I will update this photo and I bet I can get a 2016 photo. This is in fact 2014. These are reports 
on uh, social economic conditions as part of many of the UN agreements that happened in Geneva. Big data photocopied into big boxes, not very accessible. That's version 1.0, does not allow us to analyze impact. Okay. This is big data version 2.0. So I'm dean at UCLA of public health, but I, I'm really here wearing another hat. That's being director of something called the World Policy Analysis Center. Uh, for those who want to look up the data online, we're at worldpolicycenter.org. We're the largest quantitative center measuring policies around the world. We have about 2,000 indicators of policy times 193 countries. Instead of taking those boxes, it's taking 20,000 hours of work to go through all that legislation, to go through all the policies so people can access it in 20 seconds on a computer screen. But that's probably not enough. That gets us to version 3.0, which is everybody should be able to access it on their cell phone in case you actually very kindly turned off your cell phone during this talk, which I realize is probably very few people. <laughs> but on the left is what it looks like on your cell phone. It's our data. It can come up on maps on the cell phone. The important thing is how many people right now already have smartphones. That's before the $4 smartphone. We can all be getting data on what's happening at a national level out, and I'll show you in a minute why you would care about that. But first, I want to invite people who might want to work on 4.0. What does policy data look like as it should look but doesn't yet? That's two-way communication. So what we already have is what's on the books, what it's supposed to be, but not really what's happening on the ground for billions of people. As cell phones get to smartphones, to 3 billion, 4 billion, we could start to test implementation two-way communication. So why collect this big data on what countries are doing and how they're implementing it. I told you that the first reason is it has to do with a lot of mortality, but what do you do once you have it? Once you have it, there are a lot of pieces, but I think the most important piece we can do is start to measure its link to outcomes. The reason there wasn't good data before when the World Health Organization came together on what to do about how social conditions impact health was because we didn't know how to measure it. So one country changes something. The United States at last passes parental, paid parental leave, but does it have an impact? We don't know because it's passed at the same time as we have a new president, a different economy. It's hard to assess. Same thing if you're in Botswana or Benin. You need to have a lot of countries at once. Having the data we have now linked to health outcomes, and I will get back at the very end to what it would mean to link it all the way back to biology, which I totally agree with Nancy is the goal. So now, at this stage, we link policies quantitatively, those couple million indicators, the couple thousand times 193 with many different subcomponents, to outcome data, health outcome data in over 90 countries longitudinally. That allows you to look at natural experiments. It allows you to look at what happens if a national policy changes. Does it lead to a change in health outcome? Here's one of the results from a recent study. Nearly 300,000 births, 20 countries, significant impact on uh, infant mortality rates when you pass a paid maternity leave policy, and that's after controlling for health investments, public health expenditures, etc. Now, for time, I'll just be brief to say why do we believe that, besides that it's longitudinal, it's now much more rigorous quantitatively, besides the quasi-experimental design, it's because we can also look 
when we link data across these levels at mechanisms. And one of the mechanisms we know is accounting for it is increased immunization. This is the data on that, as well as increased breastfeeding. So coming back to an overall model, what should we want to do and where should we be? Uh, the first thing I would suggest is in addition to linking across levels, let's not forget that there are things we can address at each level, and let's make sure to get them right. So um, I don't want to forget the individual level. I wouldn't be here on the stage if there weren't antibiotics. I got tuberculosis as a teenager. So I very much get why there are things we can just solve at the individual level. But there are other pieces. The picture in the local community is the pump uh, and famous John Snow cholera in London. There are things that can be found, basically a data effort, by the way, to figure out the origins of the cholera. Um, Non-smoking, what we do around immunizations at a global level, there are steps we can take at each of these, but we should be putting them together. And I have a, a, a few specific uh, invites for people who want to collaborate. So what would I love to see us do to really put these together? One is, let's get the data right on what's happening at the national level. We've got a part of that, but the world has a much bigger part. Let's use two-way communication. Let's get it out in the field so that we are using big data on national policies at a different scale. There are obviously a lot of tools from machine learning to artificial intelligence that could transform what's been a very labor-intensive way to get this national data. So let's bring all that. And then let's figure out the analytic methods, which nobody really has yet, to bridge across levels. You go to our website. It shows the areas we're in. We look at social conditions across education, health, labor policy, child labor, family, environment, aging, series of other areas. Again, just worldpolicycenter.org. Um, we have a lot of initiatives, and I'm running out of time, so I won't go through them. But they very much focus on equity and health, and they're very well adapted to bridging across layers. So. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here with you all. Thank you.